Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. This is the 20th lesson in our study on 1 John. In episode 19, we studied chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. One extremely important subject we looked at was how those who are truly born again stop practicing sin. John strongly contrasted the righteous with those who claim to be born again, but continue to practice sin. These people are self-deceived, and they are outside of God's salvation, no matter how aggressively they claim to love Jesus. Their life reveals their true spiritual condition, despite what they may claim. The apostle doesn't apologize for his bold declaration about those who practice sin. He exposed their true spiritual condition, that they are children of the devil. This was a very loving thing to do for those who are followers of Jesus, so that they aren't deceived by false brethren. It was also a very loving thing for John to expose the truth of those who have been taken captive to obey the devil's will. By being exposed to the truth, those who are bound in sin are given an opportunity to find forgiveness and freedom through Christ. The next point John makes is a command, that we should love one another. He contrasts this by bringing up the historical event of the first murder that ever took place, and that's when Cain slew his brother Abel. We are commanded by the apostle to not be like Cain, whose spiritual father was the devil. Abel lived a righteous life according to God, while Cain lived an unrighteous life even though he was religious. Cain was filled with jealous anger over God accepting Abel's life and sacrifice while rejecting his life and sacrifice. The fault was with Cain not able, and certainly not with God. Cain's root problem was his perverted love of self. His idolatrous self-love left no room for loving God. From the historical account, we can see that Cain was religious, but he didn't want to give God what was acceptable to God, and this is a huge problem. He thought he could throw at God any expression of worship that comes out of his own perverted self-idolatry and that God was obligated to accept it. People do this all the time, and this is central to everyone that claims to be Christian while being in the practice of sin. Though they claim to love God, their life is hostile to God's holy nature and the laws of His kingdom. Their practice of sin is an expression of God-hatred, not love for God. Those who are in the practice of sin have made themselves an enemy of God. This leads us into verses 13-15 through that read, Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. The first point John makes in these three verses flow out of his previous point about Cain and how he hated his brother. Cain hated his brother Abel because Abel was a godly man, while Cain wasn't. Since God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice and not with Cain's, Cain allowed hatred to get a stronghold in his life through jealousy. There are many reasons why people hate, and none of them are justifiable, though some of them are understandable. If we are true disciples, then we are obligated to forgive, even when we have been victimized. Our forgiving others is never a justification of what they have done, but it's necessary for us to walk in obedience to Christ who gives us freedom. Bitterness, hatred, and prejudice keeps people from coming to Christ and separates Christians from God. John warns us that we should not be surprised when we are hated for being like Jesus. We need to understand how this truth is played out in our culture, so we don't grow angry at God or angry at those who hate us. If we make life all about personal happiness, when people hate us, then there's a real potential that we could let anger get a hold of us and move us away from Christ. Jesus warned us many times about being persecuted so that our faith wouldn't be shaken when it happens. We must make sure that if we are hated, that it's a result of our love for Christ and bearing the mark of His character. If we are hated for being criminal, obnoxious, hard to love or even like, full of self or a hypocrite, then Jesus has nothing to do with it. This was of our own making. When people hate us because we aren't Christ-like in character, then we need to aggressively confront the sin and character issues that provokes their hatred. Those who claim to be Christian and are hated for other reasons than being Christ-like can have a very difficult time seeing this truth about themselves. They are self-deceived through their religious pride, which is self-righteousness. 
The motivation of our life should be to please God. When we are hated for being righteous, God is pleased by the life that we live that incurred the hatred of the wicked. Those who practice sin are displeasing to God and belong to the devil. The practice of sin is an expression of God-hatred. The God-hatred of the unrighteous produces in them a hatred for those who are like Christ. Hatred will always have some form of outward expression, and this is why Jesus taught that a tree is known by its fruit. In verse 13, John once again used the Greek word cosmos, which we translate as world. His use of the word in this verse speaks of the spirit of the world that's defined by Satan and his demon dogs. No offense made in relation to cute little puppies. Rather than wording the verse to have a narrow interpretation that relates to immediate family members, John broadens the point by including everyone who is spiritually a child of the devil. Spiritually speaking, all God-haters are descendants of Cain, who offered to God an unacceptable sacrifice. It's strange how we can blame God for the sins we commit and grow angry at Him for the ungodly character we develop through our own moral and spiritual choices. People think that if they have religious feelings, pray, attend a church, belong to a particular denomination, cult, or religion, that they must be right with God. In our arrogance, we think that we can worship God in any way that we want, regardless of what He has to say about it. Then we foolishly believe that He is somehow indebted to us and must accept whatever we throw at Him, but this is a lie. Either we worship God in a way that's acceptable to Him, or we don't worship Him at all. Our opinions about God are worse than worthless, since they can be damnable. Though Cain put on a show of worshiping God, his opinions about what was acceptable to God proved to be spiritually and eternally fatal. His perverted opinions about God not only motivated him to kill his brother, but they devastated him and his whole family, and even spreading to all of his descendants. The lineage of Cain came to an end through the great flood because of the wickedness that he taught them. Not one of Cain's descendants was saved in the flood. Cain's wickedness not only defined his character, but the character of all of his offspring. The reason why the spiritual descendants of Cain hate those who are truly born of God is because their godly lies reprove those who are children of the devil. Rather than getting right with God through repentance, they grow angry and bitter against those who love and serve Jesus. John goes on to say in verse 14, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. The Apostle is revealing a little more of the great divide that exists between those who belong to Jesus and those who belong to the devil. In this verse, he gives forensic evidence that proves when people are genuine followers of Jesus. A verifiable proof of our being saved is when we love our brothers. The kind of love John's writing about is the new command Jesus gave us in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, where we are to selflessly love others like He loves us. In this case, John isn't talking about how we love those who are outside of the faith, but how we love those who are part of the true faith. Before we can effectively love those who don't know Christ, we must begin to love each other like Jesus loves us. When people that profess to be Christian are full of bitterness and division, they not only hurt themselves, but also the body of Christ. When talking about the unity of the saints, I often go to Psalms 133 that lays out two very important benefits that come out of unity. David's three-verse psalm reads, How good and pleasant it is when the brothers live together in unity. It's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collars of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore. There are two expressions of Holy Spirit anointing that comes through unity. The first relates to Aaron's anointing that prepared him to serve God's people, and the second is the refreshing dew that gives life to the land. The unity of the saints brings the Spirit anointing for the saints to minister to each other according to their God-given gifts, whether spiritual or natural. And the dew represents the life-giving flow of the Spirit upon a land. This represents the spiritual life that the Lord wants to flow through the church to a dying world. Division is an effective tool the devil uses to rob the church of her power, to build themselves up in Christ, and to win the lost. As long as our spiritual enemy can keep us consumed with bitterness and division, then we won't have Pentecostal power flowing through us. When we love each other like Jesus loves us, then we can put aside those things that cause division. This isn't unity at any cost, as if we must compromise with error and wickedness to be unified. This unity begins with being united with Christ and through Christ to each other.
It's through Christ that we can have unity, real unity, where selfless love is the unifying power of the Spirit working through His children. Evidence of being in Christ is when we selflessly love each other. When we love in this way, then we are given the assurance of the Spirit to know that we have passed from death to life. The only way that we can have life is when we are in unity with Christ or abiding in Christ. Evidence of our unity in Christ is proved when we are in unity with each other by loving like Jesus. Since loving like Jesus is impossible without the grace of God working in us, we can only have passed from death to life because we are doing through Christ what we could never do on our own. The second sentence in verse 14 states, Anyone who does not love remains in death. This exposes what happens when we don't love like Jesus. Those that don't love like Jesus remain or abide in death which means that they are continuing in spiritual death that will ultimately end in eternal death. John is making a strong contrast between those who abide in Christ and those who abide in death. Those who have the life of Christ love like Jesus, while those who live in spiritual death prove their condition through the selfish nature of their love. The life doesn't come through love, nor does death come through hate. God is the only source of life. Unity with Christ gives life. Separation from Him produces death. Loving like Jesus is a fruit of the Spirit that proves we are abiding in Christ. Not loving like Jesus is a fruit of the flesh that proves that we are abiding in spiritual death. How we love reveals our true spiritual condition, which is the direct result of what we do with Jesus and His Word. The idea of abiding speaks of remaining in the spiritual condition that we are in. It's not coming to Christ one day, and the next you go back into the world, and a month later you are back in Christ. Salvation isn't an in-and-out, in-and-out kind of relationship with God. True salvation causes us to abide or dwell in Christ. This doesn't mean people can't backslide, because they can. Backsliding is the slow process of making the choice to not love God supremely, which leads to idolatry of one sort or another. There's a line people cross when they go from salvation to damnation. This is the consequence of backsliding where they cease to abide in Christ. I can't tell you where that line is, but since the Lord knows us perfectly, that line is personal to each individual. The moment people cross that line, they go from life to death, or from death to life. By crossing that line, they will dwell in the condition they have chosen. Those who choose life must choose Jesus, and the moment they choose the Lord, they gain spiritual and eternal life. In like manner, those who reject Jesus reject life and will abide in spiritual death that will produce eternal death. It's only by grace that we can pass from death to life, and it's the rejection of grace that moves a person outside of salvation. John strengthens his argument by stating in verse 15, Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Through this statement, the Apostle unites his thought from verse 12 with that of verses 14 and 15. Verse 12 is about Cain killing Abel, his brother. This act of murder was proof Cain belonged to the devil. With simple logic, John establishes that all those who hate their brother are in the same devilish spirit that compelled Cain to slay his brother Abel. Just like Cain's murder was evidence of his spiritual condition, so too is bitterness and hatred clear evidence that people are not abiding in Christ, but are abiding in death. Of course, John learned the truth that hatred is equal to murder from Jesus, and we see this teaching in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. The Lord went on to declare in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If we can't love our brothers in Christ, then how are we going to love our enemies? John takes this thought even further in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. If we can't love our brothers and sisters in Christ, it's because we aren't loving God. And if we aren't loving God, it's because we are outside of salvation. John presents his thought in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This has nothing to do with salvation by good deeds or salvation by love. Loving others gives evidence that Christ is dwelling inside of his people. 
Jesus gives us the remedy when we have struggles with hate, bitterness, and prejudice. I mentioned a moment ago, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, where we see that anger brings judgment and hatred damnation. The following two verses address our need to quickly forgive and be reconciled to our brother. Jesus said in verses 23 and 24, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. The basic thought is that when we go to worship God and remember that there is a division we have with a brother, then we must make it right with him before we can offer worship to God. Implied in this teaching is the need of repentance for the part we played in causing the division. The reason why we are to leave our gift at the altar and first be reconciled to our brother is because the Lord won't accept our worship or gifts if they are defiled with bitterness and hate. We must first be clean to offer acceptable gifts of worship, praise, prayer, and service unto God. The process Jesus is presenting begins with repentance, which leads us to forgive those who have done us wrong and to ask forgiveness of those that we have wronged. This then leads on to reconciliation. John clarified his point that anyone who hates his brother is a murderer by declaring that, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. I don't know how John could say it any clearer. If we hate, then we are a murderer, and if we are a murderer, then we will not make heaven our home. The remedy for hatred and bitterness is repentance, which is followed by crying out to God for grace to love those we hate or are embittered against. Included with this must be an honest effort to be reconciled to those that we are at odds with. This isn't always possible, but an honest desire for reconciliation should still be there, and I touched on this a moment ago. There are times when reconciliation isn't possible because the person we hold bitterness against won't forgive us, has died or moved away. In such cases, God honors our repentance that will always include forgiving the person that hurt us and our desire to be reconciled if possible. Forgiving those who hurt us has many benefits. One benefit of forgiving others is the deliverance we receive from the sins of bitterness and hatred that are extremely offensive to God. That's why he commanded us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. To not be forgiven is to remain or abide in sin. This spiritual condition will eventually put people outside of salvation in a state of damnation. Since salvation is contingent upon Jesus forgiving us, And since His atonement is all about how God can justly justify repentant sinners, then our refusal to forgive is totally contrary to Christ and His atonement. Bitterness and hatred are deliberate acts of defiance against God, especially when we know that God demands we forgive others like He forgives us. We can add to this what John stated in 1 John 3, verse 9, which we studied a lesson or two back. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. Bitterness, hatred, and prejudice aren't accidental sins. They are long-term decisions to remain in a state of hatred, bitterness, and prejudice. This means that they are acts of defiance against God. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not justifying the evil that people can do to others or downplaying the pain such acts can cause. But the cause of the hurt isn't as important as our need to forgive. God is greater than our pain, bitterness, or hatred, and He will cause all those who trust in Him to overcome these sins and bondages. This is such an important point with God that our failure to forgive will bring divine discipline or even judgment. This is one reason why demons ceaselessly labor to stir our memories so that we cling to bitterness or hate. That way, we make ourselves enemies of God. It's imperative that we understand this spiritual dimension behind temptation. Demons want to lead us into bondage where they can do us great harm and make us puppets to advance their evil schemes. Forgiving others breaks the power of the devil over our lives. It sets us free from the bondage of sin and thwarts their plans. Another benefit of forgiving others is how it affects everyone involved in the drama and how it can reach far beyond the immediate circumstances. Forgiveness opens a door for those we have offended, or who have offended us, to see what God can do when we forgive. It also testifies that we belong to Jesus and are obeying what He taught. If we claim to be Christian but refuse to forgive others, then our claim is false, and this disgraces Christ before the world. 
Even the unsaved know that we should forgive others and that Christians should never hate or be prejudiced. When we refuse to forgive or crucify our hate and prejudice, then we are declaring through our words and actions that God isn't powerful enough to help us in our need. The bitterness that destroys supposed Christian marriages screams to the world that Jesus isn't all-powerful, that He doesn't really care, or that He isn't worth the effort to serve Him. Every divorce of those that claim to be Christian disgraces Christ before a watching world and becomes a real hindrance to the salvation of others. How many children of divorced parents that profess to be Christian are on their way to hell because of their parents' horrendous sins? Since the parents were so full of sin and self, they couldn't see what they were doing to their children. Their selfishness brought ruin to the family. There's a good reason why Jesus boldly stated that if we refuse to forgive, then we won't be forgiven. Every divorce is rooted in bitterness and unforgiveness. We need to see how this affects everyone involved in the lives of the couple that's getting divorced. In our compromised church culture, the world has to a large extent defined how marriage works. The consequences of this are devastating. Just look at the divorce rate in the church and you will see that it equals that of the world. Through the world's influence into the church, the atrocious sins that produce divorce are minimalized. People don't want to live under the weight of guilt, so they look for an easy way out. Either people take the path of repentance to relieve their guilt, or they will search for a way to silence the voice of their guilt, and this is a very dangerous thing to do. The sins that cause the destruction of the marriage make the husband and wife guilty before God and breaks fellowship with Him. Without genuine repentance, there can be no reconciliation with God. If there's no reconciliation with God, then people are left in their sin regardless of their claim to be Christian or their empty profession to love God. It's very dangerous to strive to silence the voice of the Holy Spirit that brings conviction, and guilt is one effect of conviction. To silence the voice of guilt without repentance and reconciliation with God leads people in their sin and only increases their guilt before God, and this is a very dangerous thing to do. Since unforgiveness is an integral part of bitterness and hate, to continue in unforgiveness is to continue in the act of murder. To take the physical life of a person is an act of murder. But to remain in bitterness, hate, and unforgiveness is a continuous act of murder. It's as if through bitterness, hate, prejudice, and unforgiveness, the person is in a constant state of killing his or her victim. A person who physically kills another needs to repent of the act of murder and everything that led up to the crime. The continuing nature of unforgiveness means that the person needs to forgive the person and then die to their bitterness, Otherwise, they will continue killing that person in their heart. And as John wrote, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Now let's move on to verse 16 where John wrote, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. The first point of this verse is very interesting. This is how we know what love is. The King James translated the sentence as, Hereby perceive we the love of God. If you read the King James, you would notice that the two words of God are italicized, indicating that they are not original to the text, but are supplied by the translators. Out of all the translations I looked at for this phrase, only the King James and the modern King James version added, Of God. All the rest of the translations left that out. The translators of the King James Version added, of God, because they believed that John was speaking about the love of God and not love in general. All the translations that left out of God understood that John's statement was a general reference to love. I think this is the case not only because it's in the Word of God here, but because it's the case with all of humanity. Ever since Adam and Eve's terrible rebellion, our ability to love was grossly perverted. Left to ourselves, we love selfishly. How selfishly we love depends upon our character and the relationship we have with God. One of the most noble kinds of love humans can have is seen in the love of a mother towards a child. Yet even here, selfishness is a part of this love. The reason why we love selfishly is due to our sin nature that taints everything we do. Now add to this that we have learned how to love from other sinful people whose love has been twisted by their sinful nature. This has gone on since the fall and has only grown worse with each passing generation. We are so far from the original model of mankind that with each generation the twisting or perverting of our love goes a little deeper. 
God gave us the gift and capacity to love. But because we can love doesn't mean we know how to love or that we do it right. The breakdown of marriage and the increase of fornication are cases in point. If all we have ever known is perverted expressions of love that are selfish in nature, then we don't know how to love properly or even what it looks like. When children grow up in homes filled with selfish love, then that's how they will love in return. John's statement, this is how we know what love is, brings us to the place that we must look to Jesus, not only for salvation itself, but to redeem our love. If we keep loving the way we have loved with our natural selfish love, then we will continue to love like that and teach others to do so as well. We can't look at each other to learn how to love except for those expressions of Christ's love being lived out through those who belong to Jesus. The pure love of God was revealed in God incarnate. He not only taught us the truths of His kingdom, but also what it means to be human and how to love. Apart from looking at Jesus, we only see selfish love to a lesser or greater degree. By looking at ourselves, we will never see the pure love of God. It's only by fixing our eyes on Jesus that we can see the selfless, disinterested love that we were created to live out and that we are commanded to live as followers of Christ. This selfless, disinterested, Christ-like love can only be lived out through divine grace. Though in this life we will never fully live out a life of love like Jesus lived, it should be our determined goal to mature in loving more like Jesus every day of our life. But how can we know how to love properly if we don't know what we are supposed to do or even be? And how can we do that which is beyond our ability to live out? The answers to both questions are found in a diligent study of God's Word, a dependency upon Jesus for the grace we need to love like Him, and a tender heart that's quick to repent when we fail to love selflessly. The more we love like Jesus, the more we will taste the wonderful benefits that come through disinterested love. Disinterested love is to love others without any selfish motive or self-seeking agenda. This is to love others without any bias or personal interest or advantage. And this is how God loves us. Since Jesus is God, it's what we see lived out through His life while He walked this earth. John brings us out in the second point in verse 16, which states, Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. This is the epitome of disinterested love. He didn't lay down His life for Himself, but for us. This is a summary of Christ's entire work of redemption that began with His miraculous conception and culminated with His ascension into heaven. He also laid down His life in loving obedience to the will of the Father, which is also another expression of disinterested love. This is seen in John chapter 8, verse 29, where Jesus pronounced, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases Him. This is who Jesus was and is in nature, not just something He did. God incarnate laid down His life because God loves us with disinterested love that has the pure agenda to transform our lives so that we can live forever in the wonder and joy of His presence. To this we are called. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Come drink your fill Let healing waters Bear away your guilt Lay down your burdens On that beautiful shore Come wash in the river Come be reborn